Grace, mercy, and peace be with you from our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. And a Merry Christmas to you and to your family. Hear these words from the angel this Christmas morning. And the angel said to them, Fear not, for behold, I bring you good news of great joy that will be for all people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior who is Christ the Lord. There are many traditions surrounding the Christmas season and Christmas Day. The tradition of families coming to church. The tradition of families gathering around the Christmas tree to exchange gifts and open presents. And later having that traditional Christmas meal. Maybe there's traditions in your household of what Christmas movies you watch that you, as we lead up to Christmas. Growing up in my family, we had a tradition of the Christmas movies that we would watch, and we covered all of our bases. We would watch the traditional animated 1966 classic, How the Grinch Stole Christmas, the one voiced by Boris Karloff. We would watch the classic A Christmas Story. We would watch it once, not for 24 hours. And my dad would always say, Ryan, that's what my childhood was like growing up. And I would think to myself, you actually had someone in your class stick their tongue to a cold flagpole. Okay. Of course, we would watch the Tim Allen's Santa Claus, and we would always watch the Charlie Brown Christmas. As we got closer and closer to Christmas, we would watch one movie in particular. We would watch the Red Boots for Christmas. We would uh, check this out each year from my home congregation's library. We would sit and watch that VHS tape once every year to remind us of the true meaning of Christmas. The movie takes place in a small German town. They're preparing for Christmas. The local Lutheran pastor is setting up the nativity scene. The mayor is literally being dragged by his bratty daughter all around town as she's trying to find that perfect Christmas present for herself. There's a lot of hustle and bustle in the city. Everyone's excited. Everyone's getting ready for the celebration except for one shoemaker. His name is Hans. Hans isn't much into Christmas. He thinks the celebration of Christmas is a waste of time, and so he busies himself in his uh, shoe shop, repairing shoes and, and talking to himself. But Hans has a change of heart, because when he goes to bed later that night, an angel of the Lord comes to him and tells Hans that he's going to receive a gift from God. And this astonishes Hans, and it changes his entire thinking of Christmas. And so he goes from the Christmas is a waste of time to, okay, God's going to come and, and give me a gift. i got to have a gift for him. And so the next morning, Hans sets out on this quest into town to find that perfect gift for God. He visits the bookstore, the watchmaker, and all kinds of other different stores, all in search of the perfect gift for God. But Hans isn't able to find that perfect gift for God. He's, uninspi he's uninspired, he's kind of upset, and he's making his way back to his shop when he sees one of the, the cities, one of the poorer people of the city. She's walking with her, her daughter, and her little daughter's shoe breaks. And that's when, idea, when Hans gets the idea that he's not going to buy some, he's not going to buy a gift for God. He's going to make something for him. So he takes the, the finest things that he has. He takes this fine leather and he makes this beautiful pair of red leather boots. He's so proud of these boots that he sets them in his shop window. And everyone in town comes and admires them. And Hans does what you and I do when we're expecting a guest. He prepares for that guest. He prepares a dinner for God. And then he begins to wait for God to come. We'll come back to the story of Hans a little later in the sermon. Did you get, give that perfect gift this Christmas? Did you receive that perfect gift this year? In our reading from the Gospel of Luke, we read of a people who had been waiting for that perfect gift for a long time. They knew from the Old Testament how God had promised that he would send a Savior they heard about that promise in Genesis and how the prophet Isaiah talked about in detail what would happen. And yet, they waited. But the idea that the people had for that Savior was 
different than what God had intended for that first Christmas. The people had the idea that this Savior who would come, he'd be a, a mighty king figure, someone who would be a warrior, someone who would fight the Romans and get rid of them. That was the idea that they had. But that was not the perfect gift that God had for his people that first Christmas night. We just read from the Gospel of Luke, that, that fam famous account of God appearing to the shepherds of all people to, risk, to give the good news of the birth of Jesus. The shepherds are out in, their out in the field. They're watching their sheep. They're just doing their job. They didn't expect that night to see the sky filled with messengers and hearing this message of a Savior being born in Bethlehem. But it fills them with so much joy that we read later in Luke that as soon as the angels leave and go back to heaven, the, angel, the shepherds turn to one another and they go to Bethlehem to see Jesus. The people were waiting for a Savior. But they didn't think it would come this way, in the form of a baby born in a stable in a small uh, town. But this is how God chose to give us that perfect gift, that first Christmas. So let's go back to Hans and see what happens with him. So Hans has just prepared Christmas dinner, and he's, he's waiting for God to visit him and to bring him that gift that he was promised. Hans does what a lot of us do when we have guests. He gets, he gets dressed up, and he just begins to wait for that guest he's been promised to show up to give him the, that gift. Hans is waiting, and he's waiting, and then there's a knock at the door, and the local mailman comes by, a friend of Hans, and he gives him some stamps, and Hans invites him in to enjoy, uh, to warm himself by the fire. As soon as Hans is, has closed the door and welcomed the mailman in, there's another knock at the door. This time, it's the local newspaper lady. She gives Hans uh, the morning edition of the Christmas newspaper. Hans invites her in to participate in warming herself by the fire and having dinner. But Hans continues to wait patiently and eagerly for that guest, for God to come and give him his gift. When finally, there's a third knock at the door. And Hans is, is thinking, okay, third time's the charm. This has to be the guest I'm expecting. But it only turns out to be the mayor who gives him a calendar, a calendar of 12 months of the mayor. And Hans invites him in for Christmas dinner. And Hans and all of his guests, they join in in Christmas dinner and, and singing, and they have a, a great time. Hans uh, has everyone leave, and he cleans up, and he falls asleep. Hans never received that visitor or that perfect gift like he was expecting. So Hans is asleep. And again, again the angel of the Lord comes to Hans and, tell, and has to kind of explain to Hans why he didn't get the gift he was expecting, the visit that he expected. The angel explains to Hans that giving gifts at Christmas time is a great custom, but the perfect gift that God has given to us is his son born in Bethlehem. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior who is Christ the Lord. This is the perfect gift that God has given to the world that first Christmas. Hans finally, it, he finally connects all the pieces. He finally gets it that God has given his one and only son for him, that that gift has already come. Hans, he has this realization, and the church bells begin to ring. And that same poor person with her daughter, they're making their way to Christmas Eve worship. As she's walking, her shoe breaks again. And Hans looks into his shop window. He sees the red boots that he made as a gift. And he takes those red boots, and he gives them to that poor woman's daughter, making her Christmas. In the closing scene, you have the, the mayor and his bratty daughter. They're making their way to worship, uh, to worship that Christmas Eve. And she finally learns what Christmas is all about. It's all about Jesus. Hans did all this because he knows of the greatest gift that God gave to the world that first Christmas, his son. And so that's the, the message that we have, the greatest gift. But yet, at the same time, it's so easy for us as a, as a culture 
to buy into the culture of this world, this idea of gifts, that Christmas is about presence, about giving that perfect gift or receiving that perfect gift. It's so easy for us to buy into that. It's easy for us to try to, and to buy into this idea that gifts and lights and trees, all that stuff makes up Christmas. We get lost, we lose the true message of Christmas behind all of that stuff. But it's simple, Christmas is all about the coming of Christ. As St. Paul tells us in the letter to, his, to the Galatians, but when the fullness of time had come, God sent forth his son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those under the law, so that we might receive adoptions as sons. Jesus was born in Bethlehem. He took on our flesh. He became Emmanuel, God with us. We live in a world that tries to take the idea of Christmas and make it all about gifts and other things and making sure we have that perfect gift for someone. We live in, in this world and we, we hear the, the Christmas message. We hear it during Advent. We hear it Christmas Eve. We hear it Christmas Day. But sometimes we get caught up in the glips and, glips and glamour of the season. The idea of the Christmas season being about giving or receiving that perfect gift. When we don't receive or give that perfect gift, we ourselves feel let down. Or we feel that we've let the other person down because we haven't given them that perfect gift. We forget or we just kind of push aside the idea, the reminder that we've been given the perfect gift in the form of God's one and only Son, Jesus Christ, born for us. But hearing the Christmas story each year, it's a time for us to remember to come back to that perfect gift that God has given to us, a gift that doesn't end. Because all the earthly gifts that we exchange with one another, they're eventually going to end. The excitement of receiving it, the novelty of the newness, it'll break, it might break, it might run out of batteries. If you have an older brother like I did growing up and he gets a hold of it, it might break. But it doesn't end at the manger. This gift that God has given to us, it goes to the cross, it goes to the empty tomb. And because of Jesus coming and living a perfect life for you and for me, we have the promise of eternal life and uh, the resurrection. We have been given this perfect gift by God. So what do we do with that now? Do we just hold on to that? We're reminded by the angels this morning, that very first Christmas, when they appeared to the shepherds, what we are to do with this gift. The angel said, Fear not, for behold, I bring you good news of great joy that will be for all people. We receive this gift in faith, Faith being trust, trust in what Jesus has done for us. When we do that, we find a peace and a calm and a joy that nothing, no gift in this world can give to us. But we just don't hold on to this gift that we've been given. We take this gift and we share it with other people so that they can experience the joy and the peace and the excitement that we have in our lives. As we gather this day and in the coming days to continue to celebrate the, uh, Christmas, let us at the same time take time to reflect upon that perfect gift that we've all been given that very first Christmas in the person of Jesus Christ. In Jesus' name, amen.